Hello and welcome to lecture number 36. Uh, today we're going to be talking about benzodiazepines. In the previous couple of lectures, we've been talking about different types of heterodips... <laughs> sedative hypnotics, pardon me. Um, in particular, in the last lecture, we talked about barbiturates. Today we're going to talk about the benzodiazepines. These drugs are primarily used to treat anxiety uh, and sleep disorders. So we'll um, spend a little time talking about this class of drugs because they are a very commonly used uh, type of uh, sedative. These drugs are primarily used for their anxiolytic properties. They are the most commonly prescribed of all the psychotropic drugs we're going to talk about. Uh, psychiatrists write less than 20% of U.S. prescriptions. The rest are generally general practitioners or family doctors. Uh, benzodiazepines work quite quickly, um, which is very important in comparison to SSRIs and related drugs, which can take several weeks to alleviate anxiety. And so oftentimes maybe a two-pronged strategy is important, for t particularly for an acute uh, anxiety panic disorder um, episode. Um, and so a short-term course of benzodiazepines might be effective, um, along with an SSRI, particularly something like Lexapro, uh, might be a, a, a potential strategy for dealing with anxiety. So, uh, I do want to say that cognitive behavioral therapy is an important part of treating um, anxiety as well, and it may take some time, uh, but you'll get longer lasting uh, benefits after treatment is finished. And so that's a pretty good strategy as well, is to go for some cognitive behavioral therapy, um, because that's one of the biggest issues we talked about in previous lectures with anxiety is oftentimes the anxiety is caused by an irrational or um, not quite accurate view of, of the world. Um, that is, people feel anxious about things that they shouldn't feel anxious about. And so getting people to react differently um, to their world oftentimes is an effective strategy uh, for uh, reducing that uh, anxiety. So what are benzodiazepines used for? Again, generally anxiolytic uh, properties or anti-anxiety drugs. They're also good anticonvulsants, so they're used to treat epilepsy and also um, during alcohol detoxification to keep people from having a seizure uh, as part of that alcohol detox. These are also sedative hypnotics, so they're used sometimes to treat insomnia. Uh, they're also central muscle relaxants, some of them more than others. In particular, uh, Valium has uh, much better uses for spasticity. Uh, they certainly do have potentiation of the central nervous system and so are also used uh, in anesthesia. This is also, of course, one of the reasons why they can be dangerous in reducing um, respiration. So in terms of the pharmacokinetics of benzodiazepines, uh, the dosage and half-life varies significantly for the 12 drugs in this class that are available in the United States. Uh, most are lipid-soluble and are thus taken orally. Uh, midazolam is water-soluble. It's one of the um, few in this class that are water-soluble. So midazolam is generally used um, as an injectable and is also available as a nasal spray for treating epilepsy. Uh, diazepam and lorazepam are also injectable. Um, so those are the only three uh, that are somewhat uh, water-soluble. Uh, some of these have active metabolites, which then increase their effective half-life, so that has to be kept in mind. So I want to do is show you some of the shorter, middle, and longer-term acting of these drugs and talk a little bit about uh, their different uses. So, and part of that has to do with their effective half-life. So the very short-acting benzodiazepines uh, include midazolam and triazolam, or Versed and Halcyon. These drugs are not used as anxiolytics. These are generally only used in conscious sedation procedures. They're used at places like your dentist's office, oral surgeon's office, uh, prior to um, surgery, uh, so it's a pre-anesthetic, so oftentimes they're used um, along with anesthesia. The intermediate acting benzodiazepines are the uh, some of the more commonly used, particularly alprazolam or Xanax is one of the most commonly prescribed drugs uh, in the United States. Uh, lorazepam or Ativan is also another uh, very commonly used drug in this class. In terms of the longer acting uh, drugs in this class, Diazepam and clonazepam are the two that are probably co most commonly prescribed, so those would be clonopin and Valium. Um, uh, clorazepate or transine has been used somewhat in this class as well, uh, along with the uh, chlorodiazepoxide. 
all right, or Librium uh, is also sometimes used in this class, but Valium and Clonopin are used much more often. In particular, Clonopin has a slight antidepressant, or it's believed to have a slight antidepressant quality to it. Um, but um, we want to be careful with that. But it does have a much longer um, half-life. So if we think about the sort of relative half-life of these sort of drugs that I've pulled out, um, I think are important to talk about. Uh, the short-acting both have about a two-and-a-half-hour half-life, which are Versed and Halcyon, which is why they're very useful in things like conscious sedation procedures. Um, Xanax has about a 12-hour half-life, out of that about 15 hours. One of the things to be mindful of that is then if you take one, say, Monday night, and then you take another one Tuesday night, you will still have a significant amount of that first dose. So if you took a milligram, which is a pretty heavy dose, um, but the math will be easier. If you took a milligram uh, Monday night, you would still have a quarter milligram left Tuesday night. Um, and so now you would have 1.25 milligrams. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, even longer acting are things like clonopin. It has a 30-hour half-life. Um, transine uh, has uh, first mass metabolism into nordiazepam, and so it actually has a much longer half-life. Um, so if you look at diazepam or Valium, uh, it's active metabolite. Nordiazepam has about a 60-hour half-life, so it's pretty long. It's with you for quite a while. And that's an important thing to keep in mind about these. I want to quickly talk about benzodiazepines in the elderly. They have a reduced ability to clear um, benzodiazepines, particularly longer-acting benzodiazepines. So the elimination half-life for diazepam and nordiazepam in elderly patients is 7 to 10 days. So this is very concerning in terms of these drugs use in the elderly. Um, so if we're going to use a shorter-acting benzodiazepine, we want to dose, uh, use about half the dose would in a younger patient. Uh, they do have very significant side effects. In particular, they can cause or increase uh, dementia. Uh, they can cause depression. And very importantly, they can increase rates of falls and hip fractures, which can be very dangerous for elderly patients. Um, oftentimes, uh, hip fractures can be fatal. Uh, not the hip fracture itself, but the subsequent uh, change in uh, functioning uh, can result uh, in very significant declines and, in fact, oftentimes fatal. We want to watch out for that, and these drugs probably should be used sparingly, if at all, in elderly patients. In terms of the pharmacological ef uh, effects, all of these drugs are pure GABA agonists. That is, they actually um, are, are facilitating GABA. Um, they fully facilitate GABA binding. At low doses, they can moderate anxiety, reduce agitation and fear uh, by their actions on receptors in the amygdala, the insula, and the orbital frontal cortex. So at these lower doses, they are very effective at moderating anxiety. Uh, we can get, of course, amnesia and confusion, and these tend to be due to effects on both the hippocampus and the cortex as well. And so these effects um, can vary depending on the type of drug we're talking about, the dose, and whether or not there's other things like alcohol involved. The muscle relaxing qualities of these drugs are due to the anxiolytic properties and GABA receptors in the spinal cord and brain stem. So one of the things, as I'm sure you know, when you're anxious, your muscles tense up. And so um, part of the effects of these drugs is to sort of get those GABA receptors in the spinal cord and brain stem to get those muscle fibers to relax. And so um, Valium is particularly effective, probably the most effective in, that, in this particular class of drugs for that uh, type of effect. So the current clinical uses for these drugs, anxiety, particularly debilitating anxiety, uh, for treatment of insomnia, and of course treatment of muscle spasm and tension, that of course can go along with anxiety and stress. All of these things are kind of dovetailing together. Uh, and these also can be used for intentionally causing anterior grade amnesia. That's often used, as I said in previous lectures, uh, to induce amnesia in patients who need to be awake for a procedure, um, but for which the procedure is probably going to be very unpleasant. And so this is often what we call a conscious sedation procedure. Um, these drugs also can be used for symptomatic treatment of panic attacks. In fact, very commonly are used uh, uh, on what's called a PRN basis or as-needed basis. 
uh, in the event of a panic attack. Finally, some nonspecific treatment of anxiety that might accompany other psychological disorders. So any, anything that's in the anxiety realm um, is part of where we may get some use of these drugs. It's important to understand that anxiety and, so and insomnia oftentimes go together. People who are anxious oftentimes have difficulty getting to sleep. And so by treating the anxiety, you can treat the insomnia. Um, these drugs sometimes are used for treatment of alcohol dependence. Um, as we talked in the alcohol lecture, it's probably not the best use of these drugs, but they are often used for that. A lot of limitations for these drugs. Of course, they can cause amnesic effects. Uh, rebound can increase anxiety and, and insomnia, can both complicate withdrawal, and so oftentimes if you go off of these drugs, you have an increase in anxiety and increase in insomnia. These drugs are addicting, and they're characterized by both physical and psychological dependence. So very problematic in patients with alcohol and substance abuse problems, so we want to be very cautious in that kind of population in terms of whether or not to use this particular drug. Um, the biggest problem with these drugs is that the withdrawal can be fatal. So particularly if this is a drug that's been used every day, you cannot just cold turkey stop these drugs because that can actually be fatal. So as single agents, these drugs are not effective in treating comorbid depression. They can make chronic pain worse. They can potentially be lethal in overdose or when combined with alcohol or opioids, so you want to be very careful of that. Um, even at low normal clinical doses, they can impair real-world driving performance. Um, and one study I found uh, a milligram of alprazolam impaired driving similar to a blood alcohol content of 0 0.15. Uh, I've haven't, having taken Xanax in the past, a milligram of Xanax, I would not be able to get out of bed. Um, everyone reacts to these drugs a little bit differently, and I'm particularly sensitive. I used to take a quarter. That was sufficient to get me a good night's rest. A milligram would put me out for quite a while. Um, women are oftentimes more affected in terms of their impaired driving than men. It's not particularly clear why. But certainly there are significant detrimental effects on driving, memory, uh, divided attention, any type of cognitive task can be reduced um, by these particular drugs. So there are certainly well-indicated and valid current uses as a pre-anesthetic medication for sedation and amnesia. Um, midazolam is certainly the go-to drug in this realm. It's very fast-acting, and uh, in the event of an overdose, it can be instantly reversed with a drug club. Amazonol we'll talk about here in a moment. Um, again, intentional drug-induced anterior grade amnesia for uh, operative procedures, or in the case of some of my research, we actually use this as a model of amnesia to study conscious and unconscious forms of memory. Um, one of the other well-indicated and valid current uses is for acute treatment of debilitating anxiety. You'll have to accept the accompanying cognitive and psychomotor impairments, but debilitating anxiety is debilitating. So for that acute treatment, short-term treatment, these drugs can be effective. Um, and so having them available for that acute treatment, I think, is, is a valid use. But what needs to be very clear is these drugs should not be used every day because that withdrawal can be fatal in daily users. And I think that's an important thing we have to keep in mind. Now, a lot of people take these drugs every day and they're just fine. Um, but for my money, this is not something that should be done every day. Um, in terms of the side effects, people, of course, feel sedated or drowsy. Uh, there can be some ataxia or difficulty with muscle movement, sort of lethargic, mental confusion, motor and cognitive impairments, some disorientation, disorientation sorry, slurred speech, amnesia, uh, some type of dementia, and of course they also can be used in combination with hypnosis. The physical and psychological dependence are particularly problematic for people uh, with substance abuse disorders and if this is used daily. Uh, another very important uh, potential side effect for this class of drugs are p possible fetal abnormalities. And what's very important about this is they can affect chromosomes in both sperm and ovum. So birth defects can be caused by use from either the mother or the father. And that's particularly important to keep in mind. One of those things that almost always is left out in terms of the discussion of these drugs, but in particular, midazolam can cause chromosomal effects on both males and females. So if you're 
under the or going to be using these drugs, if you're going to have uh, surgery, it's best that you refrain from reproducing uh, for some time afterwards. Uh, finally, one of the most significant uh, problems is interactions with alcohol and other sedatives, opioids, etc. cetera. Uh, these drugs should not be used in combination with any other of those types of sedating drugs. These drugs certainly have some abuses. Um, we don't want to use these for long-term treatment of life's anxieties. These need to be used for short, acute treatment. Um, they can be used for treatment of drug-induced REM rebound and insomnia, uh, or should not be used, sorry, of drug-induced re REM rebound and insomnia. Uh, certainly, rohypnol is a potential date rate drug in this class. Uh, should not be used for long-term treatment of alcohol abuse or alcohol withdrawal. Certainly should not be used for self-medicating for psychological distress and we should never use long-acting benzodiazepines in the elderly. So we really do not want to use these drugs for any of these purposes, particularly not as a day trip drug, but um, long-term treatment of life's anxieties, it's much better to learn how to cope with them than to pop a Xanax every time one comes up. So we have to be very careful about that. Um, and certainly that's one of the reasons why these are often used for self-medication of psychological distress. Some advantages and disadvantages. These can be very safe, and they have relatively low toxicity compared to barbiturates or alcohol. They don't induce metabolic en enzymes, so um, you don't have to start taking larger and larger doses over time. Uh, some disadvantages. They all cause amnesia of one uh, ilk or another, and so if you're studying for an exam, this is not the drug to take. Drug to take. Um, we do get um, tolerance, we don't get metabolic tolerance, but we do get receptor tolerance. Um, we can certainly get dependence and withdrawal, particularly if these drugs have been used on a daily basis. And they certainly have a pretty significant potential for abuse. And so we wanna be very cautious about these particular drugs. Uh, certainly one of the biggest problems with these drugs is potentiation of other sedative hypnotics, so they should never be used in combination with other sedative drugs, particularly with alcohol. I do want to spend a few minutes on the mnemonic effects of benzodiazepines. They all have the potential to cause temporary amnesia. Uh, and in particular, what we call anterograde amnesia, which is a, a formation of a new memory. So it blocks the formation of new memories. This is primarily for episodic memory or memory for um, like what's happening around you com as compared to semantic memory or other types of memory. Episodic memory is also called context-dependent memory. And so generally, when we're talking about um, blocking this kind of memory, it's you just don't remember what happened during that time period. So this might be useful for pre-surgical preparation. It makes people calm. Then if there's anything, you know, difficult or traumatic that, or potentially traumatic that needs to be uh, occur, then uh, you won't have memory for that. Uh, there may not be a problem these, this particular side effect, this mnemonic effect, if it's taken for sleep. So if you're gonna go to sleep anyway, um, it doesn't matter if you remember sleeping or not. One of the problems, and we'll talk about this in the next lecture, is the norbenzodiazepines like Ambien, people will get up and do things and not remember doing them. And they talk about it as being sleepwalking, but it's really not. It's that you're awake, you just don't remember being awake and going and making food or getting in your car and going someplace. There's lots of cases like that. Um, the other issue with this is high anxiety itself, sorry, high anxiety itself may worsen memory. Um, so we talked a little bit about this when we talked about um, cortisol and depression and its effects on memory. So high levels of cortisol uh, may cause some memory effects. So in very anxious people, benzodiazepines might not be amnesic because these two might kind of work against one another. So, how this works is GAB is known to inhibit long-term potentiation in the hippocampus, and that's this neural process believed to be part of what we call memory consolidation. So taking your experiences and turning them into permanent memory. And primarily, these drugs have an effect on what we call explicit memory, or memory for which we have conscious awareness. And so, what we, um, Elliot Hirschman was able to demonstrate in some research that I conducted with him later on, is that primarily this affects our conscious access to times and places whereas implicit memory is relatively spared, and those are memories for which we don't have conscious awareness. 
Critically, again, and I mentioned this, I think, previously, people are unaware of the effects of these drugs on their memory. And what we showed in this particular study is that people rated their memory as being just as good when they were under the influence of midazolam as when they weren't given any drug at all. So what's very important to understand is that people don't know that there's anything wrong with their memory. And so things like discharge instructions uh, from a surgical setting need to be given to somebody else because the patient may think there's nothing wrong with their memory, but in fact won't remember that later. Finally, uh, in particular, um, the medium and longer term acting versions of these drugs, if they're combined with alcohol, they can have a severe effect on memory. And so you want to watch out for that. So that's a little bit of an introduction to how these drugs affect memory. I want to finish with um, a discussion of what's called flumazenil. This completely blocks the benzodiazepine receptor, uh, reverses any effects of the benzodiazepine given prior to flumazenil. And so what that does is it makes use of these drugs in anesthesia particularly safe. Oftentimes, when I've talked with the anesthesia uh, residents I used to work with in my research, is in an outside of research setting, I mean, they'll just give, you know, if they're going in for surgery, they'll just give somebody a whole vial and um, knock them out. They'll be fine. They're obviously, everything's being monitored safely. Uh, and if there's any trouble, this drug can be immediately reversed. And so that's one of the things that makes their use in the clinic particularly very safe. And so this is unlike the barbiturates where there is no drug available for reversing their effects. All right, well, that gets us to the end of our discussion of benzodiazepines. We'll talk a little bit more about nord benzodiazepines and drugs to treat insomnia in the next lecture.